It stands alone among the sagebrush and the sand, like a fortress against the elements. Its windowless concrete walls reach upward into the desert sky. It was the first, one of three built during the war, and one of nine eventually constructed along a 50-kilometer stretch of the Columbia River known as Hanford. It was referred to as the Pile by its workers and was given an innocuous title of 105B, or simply B. But on September 26, 1944, a new science was proven. The world changed and the atomic era began. It was August 1939, and tensions throughout the world provoked renowned scientist and physicist Albert Einstein to draft a letter to President Roosevelt, informing him of the work being done by Enrico Fermi and Leo Szilard on converting energy from the element uranium. He was convinced that the Germans were working on this same development, and if they discovered how to harness this power first, then the stability of the world was at stake. This new phenomenon could lead to the construction of bombs, he wrote, and it is conceivable, though much less certain, that extremely powerful bombs of a new type may be constructed. From this short letter rose the largest secret war construction project ever. Given the code name Manhattan Project, it would span multiple locations throughout the U.S., cost over $20 billion, employ hundreds of thousands of construction workers, all sworn to secrecy, displace families and communities, and create an environmental cleanup legacy that is still prevalent today. All with only one purpose in mind, to create an atomic bomb. General Leslie R. Groves from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was assigned to lead the Manhattan Project. At first he declined, wanting to serve his country overseas in the oncoming war. But when told his efforts would help end the war, and perhaps all wars, he reluctantly agreed. Only weeks earlier, on December 2, 1942, scientists led by Fermé and Szilard at the metallurgical labs of the University of Chicago had sustained the first controllable nuclear reaction. It was this reaction that would transform the metal uranium into a new radioactive substance called plutonium. E.I. DuPont Company was chosen as the primary construction company. They had experience in explosives and new technologies, and General Groves was impressed with their management style. When Groves stood before DuPont's board of directors to present what they would be helping the government build, he had the information laid out in front of them with the pages turned down. He informed them that they would be responsible for the most vital and secretive war effort our country has ever known. All board members unanimously agreed without once turning over the papers to see what they had agreed to. In the end, they would build and operate the necessary structures for all costs, plus one dollar. Thirty-three-year-old Army Corps of Engineers Lieutenant Colonel Franklin T. Mathias, who had previously assisted General Groves in the construction of the Pentagon, was chosen to find a site for the reactors and separation plants that would produce plutonium. A large supply of clean water, an abundance of electricity, a large remote tract of land, and favorable climate were the criteria needed. On December 16, 1942, Mathias found the location he was looking for. To Matthias, it was a barren landscape with limitless possibilities. But to the residents of Eastern Washington, who had just made it through the Great Depression and were looking forward to a bountiful spring, it was home. On New Year's Eve, Matthias and his team from DuPont met with General Groves to report their findings. By March 1943, 1,500 landowners found their lives turned upside down as letters of condemnation ordered them to evacuate their homes, no questions asked, 
and make way for a top secret government project essential to the war effort. Residents of White Bluffs, Hanford, the town of Richland, and even a tribe of Wanapum Indians were evicted in the name of the Manhattan Project. Groves, duly impressed with his young lieutenant colonel, asked Matthias to oversee construction of the Hanford Engineer Works, also called Site W. It was determined that a temporary camp was all that was needed. The only permanent structures were to be the processing and production plants. Living quarters to house the permanent workers would be built in nearby Richland. Construction barracks were built for the men and women who streamed into Hanford with promises of high paying wages. They were segregated by gender and race with the women's camp under 24 hour guard. Smitten couples were reduced to holding hands between the fences. Those lucky enough to bring their home in tow or to rent one of the few government trailers available found cozy or to most cramped accommodations at the Hanford Trailer Park. It was a, a, an upside down world here during the construction of Hanford because the physicists and the key engineers were, were in general very young people. Physics was a brand new science. There was no such thing as a person who'd been practicing nuclear physics or the science of this engineering for 30 years just didn't exist. So the experts were very young, often in their 20s. And most of the construction workers were a lot older because the draft was taking men up to the age of 38. So you had a little bit of an upside down world where the very young were supervising the much more experienced people. Jobs were easy to find. Oh, you'd stop, light a cigarette on a street corner and get two job offers. You just had to be willing to learn and uh, uh, work safely. And that was all it needed. It, they, they they didn't have reactor operators on the, the circuit anywhere, so they, they trained you on the job. It was a different world in the 1940s. First of all, there was abundant trust of the government, and there was a different ethic in terms of if you're assigned to do a job, you do the job, and you really don't ask any questions. And that even held true in, in normal industry to some extent, although it was exaggerated here. We had a situation where people were told, you're doing important war work. It's out west, and that's all we're going to tell you. As Camp Hamford grew to over 50,000 residents, so too did the large concrete structures along the Columbia River. The basic design of B Reactor was derived from the experimental reactor built at the University of Chicago, albeit with one slight modification. The test reactor at Chicago operated at a power level of one half a watt. B would attain a power level of 250 million watts. B reactor's core would be built as a three-story assembly of graphite blocks drilled through with a cylindrical lattice of channels into which would be inserted slugs of uranium metal coated with aluminum. Nine metal horizontal control rods separated the channels and 29 vertical safety rods were available to shut the process down. When the control rods were removed, the uranium would begin a reaction and create heat. Water from the Columbia River would flow through the channels for cooling. When the slugs had been sufficiently exposed, they would be pushed out the back of the core into a cooling pool and quickly decayed to plutonium. Once cooled, the irradiated plutonium would be transferred by special water-filled rail cars to the separation plants. These plants, called canyons by the workers, because of their long, narrow shape, would use chemicals to separate the plutonium from the aluminum and other metals. Then the plutonium would continue on to final processing. And the fact that they could take uh, one metal and make another metal, transmutation to me, was uh, unbelievable. You figure the reactors are only designed for uh, just for the, to end the war, and that's all, all they were shooting for. And then six months after the Nagasaki bomb, uh, Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of uh, Great Britain, he made an announcement. He said, "We are now in the midst of a Cold War with Russia." Well, at that point, then hey, you know, these are no longer just a temporary. Uh, 
reactor, these have got to keep going. And that's when they start doing all the major improvements and trying to figure out how to preserve them longer. The B reactor has a lot to say for what it has accomplished. Since the process of producing plutonium was new and unproven, many construction techniques and procedures had to be invented as it went along. It was noted that the finished blueprints to B reactor were not even delivered to the site until two weeks after the reactor went critical. You talk about having to be innovative, they had to be innovative. The first uh, chief operator I had when I went to work out there went out to the reactors and I said, what's all these pipes? And he said, that's your job. He said, uh, a week from now I want you to come back and tell me where that pipe came from, where it goes to, and what it did. And uh, that was just the way they taught us. You had to teach yourself. And if there was anything there that you was wondering about, you had to go make a drawing and figure out or make a statement on what it did. Uh, and that way you'd come up with different ways to, to make things better. On-the-job training was status quo, and safety was always of utmost importance. Procedures were in place for any situation. Each control rod was connected to a sensor that would trigger the reaction to shut down if a problem was detected. This shutdown was referred to as a scram. Well, actually, uh, that scram came from the small test reactor in, in Chicago. There they had one safety rod hanging up on over a, a pulley and down, tied down. And the man, if they wanted to shut the reactor down, he'd take an axe and cut the wire, or cut the rope. And so that was safety control rod axe man. <laughs> so actually, of course, I didn't know that until later on. I was uh, scram, just went scram out of the reactor. <laughs> we had to get out in a hurry. <laughs> the thing that becomes instilled, it's, it's second nature, is safety. These people who designed and built that, those machines out there, they didn't have a model to go by. If you're going to build a car, you can say, well, what did we do in 1906? What did we do in 1926? They couldn't do that out there. They started by saying, OK, uh, we know this can be done. We're not sure how to do it, but we're going to design and we're going to make sure that uh, there is uh, safety to the environment, to the populace in this area and to the people who work here, and, and they did. Secrecy reigned supreme during the construction project. Groves and DuPont had developed a departmentalized procedure where workers on one part of the construction process had no knowledge or contact with any other area of the construction. It was understood, say nothing, ask nothing, and keep your job. Well, uh, one of the reasons that for me was, uh, like I said, my father was here as a security patrolman. And he said, just keep your mouth shut and you'll get along good. And uh, I, you'd be working with somebody one day and he wasn't there the next day and you find out, well, he said something wrong. And he was just gone. Well, one way that they uh, proceeded while they were building B reactor was to have compartmentalization in other words, if you're a person working on the graphite, that's all you're going to know about. You're not going to know about the pipes, and you're not going to know about the electrical systems. And if you're a water a thermal hydraulics expert working on the water delivery system, you're not going to know about the graphite. And so they kept uh, the work very separate, and they just had a few people. And it wasn't the construction workers. It was a few of the high-level supervisors who knew the entire scheme. On September 26, 1944, 18 months from beginning construction, B Reactor was activated. A small group of operators and scientists, led by Fermé, 
gathered around the control panels as theory became reality. Everything worked perfect as the power level was increased to 9 megawatts and held there. Then to everyone's surprise, the reactivity began to slowly decrease. The reactor was shut down, tests were conducted, and a hunt for leaks proceeded. The following morning, the process was started again, and the results remained the same. For the next two days, this mysterious loss of power baffled all involved. Then that Friday morning, September 29th, physicist John Wheeler had solved the mystery. It was an unexpected byproduct known as xenon, which was absorbing neutrons and spoiling the reaction. The original design of the reactor pile, devised at Chicago, called for 1,500 parallel channels be made for slug insertion, and DuPont was assured that this was all that was needed. DuPont's engineers, through conservatism or perhaps wariness of MetLab's overconfidence, had added 504 extra channels to the design. The solution was simple. Load more slugs into the extra channels and increase the reactivity to override the xenon effect. The fix worked and atomic history was made. Well, B Reactor was a, a, the perfect marriage of science and engineering because pure science was how does the physics reaction work. But engineering was how do you build a machine that can encompass this reaction, encase it, provide a safe atmosphere for it to operate in. And so the engineers at the DuPont Corporation added some extra tubes to the d original design that the scientists had put forth. And the scientists were um, sort of contemptuous and said, we don't need those. We've told you how many we need, and that's all we need. And the engineers said, well, if you fail, who's going to take the blame? And so at that point, the scientists said, OK, put in some extra tubes, you know, do what you want, sort of thinking they will never be needed. They were needed. And so that's why the machine, B Reactor, is just as much a product of engineering as a product of science. On November 24th, 1944, B Reactor's first irradiated slugs were pushed into the cooling pool. By then, the Hanford Engineer Works was the third largest city in the state of Washington. A thriving society of 40,000 employees quartered in barracks, the world's largest trailer court with 13,000 residents, eight mess halls, each the size of a football field, two grocery stores, four ice houses, a lumber yard, two automobile service stations, an electrical fix-it shop, and even a dog pound were set up to service this temporary city. A schoolhouse and gymnasium for children up to the eighth grade were located in the main camp area. High school students were furnished free bus transportation to neighboring Richland. All needs were factored in, including 24-hour patrol duty, public health services, fire protection rights, surface streets, 24-hour cafeterias, and weekly entertainment. All part of the critical morale effort as worker turnover was constant. People came from every state in search of work. Most were unprepared for the desert conditions, for the secrecy, the lines, the heat, and the dust made family life far from ordinary. I'm reminded of the fact that uh, the only way a man could get in the gate, that the fence that surrounded that facility, women's barracks and the women's rec hall, was to be in the company of a woman. You couldn't get in the women's rec hall. You couldn't say, oh, well, I, my date's waiting for me in there. Uh-uh. She comes out here and takes you by the hand and leads you in there. That's OK, but not otherwise. It was actually it was quite an experience out at Hanford. They had big rest, uh, restaurant that uh, eating places that would seat 2,000 people. We'd go in there and sit down, and they would bring food to us. And if we finished cleaning up one dish, we'd raise it in the air, and they'd come and bring us another one. On February 1st, 1945, Matthias himself delivered the first shipment of processed plutonium to the test lab in Los Alamos, New Mexico. The container was about a two-foot cube wrapped in paper and secured tightly with ropes. He was driven to Portland and went by train to Los Angeles, where he met a courier 
who would deliver the product to Los Alamos. Well, when, when Colonel Mathias met this other man at uh, Los Angeles, um, of course, the other man did not know what he was carrying because that was part of wartime secrecy and nobody was supposed to know all the parts. Well, Mathias knew that this was extremely dangerous and expensive and valuable material. So he asked um, the other fellow if he had um, booked a sleeping booth in the, tr in the train. And the man said, no, I'm just going to kind of sleep sitting up in my seat. And Matthias said, well, you might want to get a, a sleeping booth with a locking door because the product you're carrying is worth $350 million. Well, in those days, that was a huge amount of money. That's about $4 billion today. And so it, is, it was shockingly huge to that man. He'd never heard of anything in his life that cost that much. And Matthias was, of course, referring to the cost of the whole Hanford endeavor. The science had been proven successful. Uranium had been transformed into plutonium, a highly reactive and volatile material. But would an implosion of an atomic fission bomb actually work? All that theory was realized on July 26, 1945, when product generated at Hanford was used for the Trinity test in a remote section of the Alamogordo Air Base in New Mexico. For the first time in history, there was a nuclear explosion. Fourteen days later, on August 9, 1945, Hanford and B Reactor would forever be part of history when Nagasaki was bombed with the Fat Man bomb charged with Hanford plutonium, an explosion that was equal to 22,000 tons of TNT. The Japanese surrendered unconditionally five days later. World War II, the war to end all wars, was over. The reactor continued on producing plutonium to fuel the burgeoning U.S. nuclear arsenal as America became involved in a new kind of war, the Cold War. On February 13, 1968, B reactors shut down for good. Over the life of B, further testing, improvements, and innovation were commonplace. Its existence not only changed the way societies conduct war and peace, but paved the way for the new technology of nuclear energy, science, and medicine. The American Society of Mechanical Engineers in 1976 summed up its contributions to history with the awarding of B Reactor as a National Historic Engineering Landmark, calling B one of man's most brilliant scientific and advanced engineering achievements. Well, um, you know, when we think about preserving B Reactor, we think about why would we do that, you know? Well, think about any other great icon in American history. Think about the Liberty Bell. The Liberty Bell is old and is cracked. It's not very valuable all by itself, but it symbolizes to us the fact that we're all connected, that we are a nation, that we have common goals, that there are things we will fight for. The same thing is true when you visit Appomattox Courthouse, where the Civil War ended, or you visit the White House, or you visit the bridge at Lexington and Concord where the American Revolution essentially began. We go there because we want to be in the presence of something that tells us more about who we are. Who dreamed something there? Who dared? Who presumed? Who failed? Who faced loss? Who constructed? And we have to do that because that makes us a people, that weaves us together as a nation. B Reactor is a voice for all those things. B Reactor tells us something about who we are, what we're willing to do, what we're capable of, and also tells us something about loss, about waste in the Columbia River, about loss of life. It has a lot of lessons to teach. So whether people are in favor of the reactor, think the reactor was a good thing to build, or they think it was a terrible thing to build and it never should have been built, I think all people will agree it should be preserved because if it's not preserved, we won't debate it, we won't learn its lessons, and its voice will be silent.